We're going to do 10 questions on Luke trivia. So you can number one to 10 and see what we remember. Question number one. To whom, oh, and it's multiple choice. To whom was the book of Luke addressed? A, Simeon. B, Zacharias. C, Theophilus. And then when everyone's answered, what's the answer? C, Theophilus. Good job. So you can yell out the answer when I tell you, you can yell out the answer. Number two, who was the angel that announced both the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus? A, Michael. B, Gabriel. C, I can't even do it. Raphael. (laughs) I thought I could do it with a straight face. So A or B? (laughs) Anyone? B, Gabriel. Yes, not Raphael. Number three, who was the mother of John? A, Anna, B, Ruth, C, Elizabeth. You gotta wait, I'll sing a little like Jeopardy song. And then the answer is? C. Elizabeth, good job. Four, how old was Jesus when he was taken to Passover as a boy? A, 12 years old, B, 40 days old, or C, eight days old? A, 12 years old. Oh, how old was Jesus when he was taken to Passover as a boy? A, 12 years old. It's when they brought him to the temple. B, 40 days old, or C, eight days old? That's the confusing part. This one has a little more answers. Oh, we're all over the map. Okay, so think about Luke. You studied Luke. We only got one age, I think. Twelve. So it's a bit of a trick question because it makes you think of like the circumcision law, right? Which was eight days, but he was 12 years old. Number five, what did the disciples want Jesus to teach them to do? A, preach, B, pray, C, fish for men. A, preach, B, pray, C, fish for men. What did the disciples want Jesus to teach them to do? And? Yes, teach us to pray, and then we get the um, Lord's Prayer out of that. Number six, what question prompted the parable of the Good Samaritan? A, am I my brother's keeper? B, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Or C, who is my neighbor? What question prompted the parable of the Good Samaritan? A, am I my brother's keeper? B, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Or C, who is my neighbor? Answer? C. Yeah. Am I really echoey? Okay. Seven, who was the widow who never departed from the temple? A, Ruth. B, Anna. C, Elizabeth. Who was the widow that didn't depart from the temple? And? Anna. Good job. Eight. How long did Jesus pray before choosing his 12 disciples? A, 40 days. B, all night. Or C, one day. How long did he pray before he chose the 12? What's your guess? B, all night. Yep. (laughs) Oh. Number nine, who loved the chief seats in the synagogues? A, the Pharisees, B, the scribes, or C, the lawyers? Who loved the chief seats in the synagogue? Chief, chief, chief. Chief. 
<laughs> the nosebleeds. <laughs> I love it. Chief, the best seats. A, Pharisees, B, scribes, C, lawyers. T, all of the above. It probably was, but what's your biggest answer? A, Pharisees, yeah. I don't know, I took this trivia test off of Google, so who knows? Number 10, what was the profession of the author of the book of Luke? A, fisherman, B, tax collector, C, doctor. What was Luke's profession? Anyone? Doctor. Good job. Who got 10 out of 10? Lots of you. That's why I didn't bring a prize. I would like throw candy out or something. Okay. Well, that was fun. All right. So Luke part two, <clears throat> welcome back. If you're brand new, welcome for the first time. Do we have any brand new here? I'll make you raise your hand, that's embarrassing. Hi, welcome here. Just two of you? Yeah. Welcome here. Um, we're in a new space, so Northview graciously offered to give us this room. The other Bible study, Matthew was meeting in here, and they said, you can have it, because it's cozy, and so we said, yes, please. So we've got coffee right out there, treats if you guys bring them. Um, I think it'll give us a bit more community and it'll feel cozier. So this is our class zero. So you all should have picked up your studies and you do all get that little schedule card with the dates and the lessons. So basically I think just family day is when we're not meeting, right? Just the one? Yeah. Um, so same format as last, as part one. So we've got our discussion groups will start next week. At seven o'clock, you will meet in your rooms with your leaders. You should have got an email or will get one with your room number. Um, and then we'll come in here at eight o'clock and have large group teaching in this room. Uh, discussion group culture. We love discussion group to ask our hard questions. So bring your hard questions. It's a safe place to wrestle through. Um, the things that you see that you don't understand, the things that really move your heart. It's just a place where we can reason together. Uh, your leader will not have all the answers, so they will always direct you back to the text. We want scripture to interpret scripture, and the precept tagline is, we want you to learn to study the Bible for yourself, but not by yourself. You discover truth for yourself, but not by yourself. And that's why the precept format is to meet in discussion with others first, to reason through the scriptures together, and then we move to application um, to our hearts and our hands as we listen to a large group teaching. There will be times when we find a really difficult passage, and we might have to just put a big red question mark there um, and come back to it later, and that's okay. It's actually the beauty of studying inductively because we slow down, we ask the who, what, where, when, how questions, and then as we interrogate the text, we start to see it unfold, and then we can interpret, interpret it accurately. And usually, as you keep studying, sometimes years later, you will find the answer to that big red question mark, um, and that's really amazing when you do that, and the Lord shows you that. So we put in the time and the discipline as we study and the Holy Spirit illuminates it and reveals the truth of his word. So your leader might say, put a big red question mark, and that's okay. It used to drive me nuts when Angie used to say that. Um, we study God's word to know God. So if we want to feel deeply about God, then we must learn to think deeply about God. Jen Wilkin is a Bible teacher in Texas, and she says, the heart cannot love what the mind does not know. And precept mission is to know God deeply. And because of knowing him deeply, we live differently. One of your handouts is the inductive study method. Um, for those that are brand new to precept, that's the inductive study method there. And then just a refresher for those of us who have been studying already. Um, so as we begin this journey of inductive study, we remember that our Bible is our primary source. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired, breathed out by God, and it's sufficient to bring us to the true knowledge of God and equip us for every good work, to live a life of godliness. So we use our Bibles as our primary source as we study. So inductive study, it's not a magic potion. It's simply we're slowing down. 
So it's three easy steps. It's um, observation is the first step. Observation is the what. What do we see? What does it say? We simply look at the text, we observe it, and we ask questions. And this helps us slow down. You see things that you normally wouldn't. Um, and asking, who is the author? Who is he writing to? When is this happening? Do we see a where? What's happening? We also mark repeated words in a passage. If the author is repeating something, he wants us to hear it. Like when you lecture your children and you're just emphasizing it over and over, you're like, what is he trying to get across? Observing also helps us enter into the historical context. Precept has a line, context is king, because context informs the meaning of a passage. So what comes before the passage that we're studying? What comes after it? Is there any, th any historical information included that helps us put us in the passage? Step number two is interpretation. So observation is the what, and interpretation is so what. Now what does it mean? So we're trying to get to the author's intended meaning. A passage or book of scripture has one intended meaning. Spirit-inspired words by a human author, but addressed to a specific audience at a specific time. So as we look at what we've observed, our key repeated words, phrases, we try to piece together what the author's intent is. What is he emphasizing? And we always let scripture interpret scripture. We'll gather our information from the text itself and from cross-references throughout the week. And if you come to something tough, we always have to remember that scripture will never contradict scripture. And then we move to application, step three. Application's the now what? So now that I know this, what do I do? How do I respond to what I've learned? And how do I live differently, think and believe differently? The application's intended us to move, move us from head knowledge to our heart and hands. How have our affections grown for God, our worship? And what do we do as an outpouring of his spirit and his grace? And our end goal is to be transformed into his likeness and to know him. And because we know him more, we can trust him more. Our walk should look different. It shouldn't just stay in our heads. I always think of the Pharisees. They were just puffed up with head knowledge, right? But their fruit was not there. And so we want to look different and we want to be different because of Jesus. So that's a little bit about inductive study. Um... I'm going to do a little review of Luke, uh, part one. So just to kind of refresh our memories, we're going to do a little review. If you want to, um, at the back of your study, there's an appendix in the back, and there's an at a, it's called an at-a-glance sheet. I think it's on page 159, and it will have all the themes, chapter themes written down. We went through chapters 1 to 16 in part one, so it should have all the themes written down on it. You can look at that if you want while I'm chatting. So Luke part one took us through the first 16 chapters of Luke. So for those that did not study part one, it will be okay to start in part two. You're going to still be ministered to by what you learn. It's a seven week study. Um, day one homework actually gives a little bit of a review. And we're going to do a little review tonight to get familiar with the chapters that have come before. So that at a glance sheet you have. Um, so those are chapter themes which we would draw out of our marking repeated words and phrases. So as we observe a chapter, we come up with a chapter theme that helps us remember what's in that chapter. I usually pencil it in because sometimes as I'm studying it, I'm like, oh, it's actually more about this. It's just a way for you to remember. There's no right or wrong answer. Chapter theme. So Luke, so I want to highlight the theme of joy and gladness that we see in the book of Luke. January can always use a little bit of joy, especially with that kind of weather. So let's bring out the joy tonight, okay, ladies? So Luke, yeah, Luke chapter one is baby announcements. Those are always joyful, right? We've got the birth of John the Baptist and a prophecy about the birth of Jesus. And chapter 114 tells us that the angel, who we now know was Gabriel, not Raphael, he spoke to John's father, Zacharias, after years of barrenness and said, your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. It's a joyful announcement. 
we also see a call to repentance in the book of Luke. And that starts with John the Baptist. Luke 3, we read that the word of God came to John in the wilderness. And John came preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Isaiah prophesied this about John the Baptist. He, John, he will be a voice calling in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. So the wilderness was a, quite a literal wilderness. We read that John spent time living there, eating like locusts and grasshoppers and stuff. Um, but the theme of wilderness in scripture can also refer to a spiritual wilderness, um, a kind of lostness or a wilderness of sin, dry and weary, hopeless people that need saving because we need a savior. We need joy and gladness. Luke 176, Zechariah says this about his son, John. You, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways and to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by forgiveness of their sins. So John's message in Luke is a call to repentance. So I'm actually going to take you back to the Old Testament because it's my favorite. So you have a handout on Joel, chapter 1, if you want to pull that out. And pull out a couple of marking pens if you brought your colors. If not, just use your pen. You can draw different shapes. The book of Joel, we see God using Joel the prophet to call God's people, to call Israel to repentance. So we're going to read through that. So take out your two colors. We're going to read verses 1 and 5 to 7. I want you to mark Israel. Any reference to Israel, you, there's different descriptions of Israel in this passage, so we'll, I'll point them out. Anything related to God's people. And then also mark the word nation and its pronouns. Are we ready? Russell, Russell. Ready, Karen? Ready, okay. Joel. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Awake, you heavy drinkers. Who's the you? Israel, yeah. Heavy drinkers. Awake, you heavy drinkers, and weep, and wail, all you, Israel, you wine drinkers, because of the sweet wine. For it has been eliminated from your, mark that, your mouth. Verse 6, for a nation, you can mark nation, different color or a little different shape. For a nation has invaded my land. So what land would that be? Israel. So you can mark that because that's referring to his land. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth, whose teeth? Nation. Are the teeth of a lion. And it, the nation, has the jaws of a lioness. It, the nation, has made my vine a waste. What's my vine? Israel, his people, yeah. And my fig tree, Israel, a stump. It, the nation, has stripped them bare and hurled them away. There, Israel's branches have become white. So what do we learn? If you look at what you marked now, look at where you marked Israel. What do you learn about Israel in this passage? What are they going through? How are they described? You can yell out, because I can hear you in this room. How are they described? Drinkers. drinkers heavy drinkers. Mm-hmm. They're mourning. Mm-hmm. What else? They're being invaded. Yeah. And exiled. Yeah. Exiled, hurled away. People Sorry? People yeah. We get that from him saying it's my vine and my fig tree, right? Mm -hmm. They belong to God. <laughs> Anything else? Mm -hmm. What about the branches? Bear, yeah, stripped bear, right? Sounds like fat could be famine. They could be starving, dried up. 
So God uses a present-day plague to call people to repentance in the book of Joel. An army has come. And what does God ask them to do in verse 5? Yeah, wake up, cry, weep. Judgment's coming. So this is Joel the prophet's message. So we're going to flip your page over, I think. We'll read verses 8 to 12. This time we're going to mark dried up and cut off. Mark those the same way, dried up and cut off. And then mark joy and rejoice in like a happy color. So verse 8 continues. Wail like a virgin clothed with sackcloth for the groom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off. Sorry. From the house of the Lord. The priests mourn minister of the Lord. The field is ruined. The land mourns for the grain is ruined and the new wine has dried up. You can mark that. Fresh oil has failed. How sad that the new wine has dried up. Hey, Colleen. Verse 11, be ashamed, you farm workers. Wail, you vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine has dried up and the fig tree has withered. I marked withered. Sounds like dried up. The pomegranate, the palm also, the apple tree, all the trees of the field have dried up. Indeed, joy, so mark joy. Joy has dried up from the sons of mankind. Has not food been cut off before our eyes? And joy And rejoicing, you can mark rejoicing too, cut off from the house of our God. So what do we learn by marking dried up? Huh? Oh, it's not on my page. I skipped 13. I don't have it on my page, so tell me. Read it. Yeah, that's an important one. Sorry, I didn't type it on my laptop. Um, So what do you learn from marking dried up and cut off? What's happening? What's dried up? You can answer right from the text. Joy. Joy, yeah. What else? Sacrifices, yep. Offerings. Trees, did somebody say? Yeah. Yeah, like it sounds like just famine, right? Have you ever felt dried up? Stuck in a wilderness? In a weary and dry season of life or a wilderness of sin that you keep falling into? And so we learn by marking joy that... It's interesting, he goes through and he's like, all of this has dried up, all your physical, your agriculture, your crops, your offerings, and then he's saying joy and rejoicing have been cut off from the house of our God. So temple sacrifices have stopped. There's no joyful worship in God's house right now. The Good News Translation says it like this, we look on helpless as our crops are destroyed. There's no joy in the temple of our God. So it's a time of crisis, and what does God ask them to do? He asked them to get dressed in what? Do you remember why? What the, that's a picture of? Mourning, yeah. A visible picture of repentance, right? He asked them to fast and cry out to the Lord. He's pleading with them to repent and to turn. And he's warning them that the day of the Lord is near. And we hear John the Baptist's message in here. A gracious God calling people to repentance. Joel tells us that rejoicing has dried up along with their grain and their new wine. They are in a wilderness, quite literally, famine has come. And they're also in a spiritual wilderness as they aren't even able to bring sacrifices into the temple, which results in no joy. Joy's dried up. So now in the book of Luke, we've got John the Baptist, a voice in that wilderness, saying that gladness and joy will return in Christ. Luke mentions joy quite a bit in this book of his. Luke 3, 5. 
Every ravine will be filled, every mountain and hill will be leveled, the crooked will become straight, and the rough road smooth, and all mankind will see the salvation of God. Gladness and joy is going to return in Christ. Do you remember in chapter one, other places that we saw joy, the word joy? Pregnant ladies? Do you remember? Somebody jumped for joy in the womb? Yeah. John the Baptist jumped for joy in the womb when um, Elizabeth met Mary, who was carrying Jesus at the time. We also see Mary rejoicing in God, her savior, this young mama. She's got gladness and joy, and she humbly receives God's favor um, to bear his son. And then after John's birth, when Zechariah gets his words back, he joyfully praised God and prophesied, looking forward to the redemption that was coming and the Savior coming to show mercy and rescue, gladness and joy in the coming Savior. Isaiah 35 says this, the wilderness and the desert be glad. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with a shout of joy. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble and say to those with anxious hearts, take courage and fear not. Behold, your God will come and he will save you. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion. With everlasting joy will be upon your head. My sister and I turn everything into a song, so I, that just, I had to do that. Joy's coming. I, did I wreck this, Heather? <laughs> I tucked my hair in my, it felt weird. <sighs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're going to be ransomed and redeemed from the wilderness and the desert. So we come to God and sometimes we feel barren and dry and weak and overwhelmed and the power of Jesus comes to change and heal us and provide for us and we receive that gladness and joy in Christ. So Luke 1 points to the coming Savior. In Luke 2, we see gladness and joy when the angels are praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. The gladness and joy of the shepherds, they get to run and go see baby King Jesus. And what about Simeon in the temple? Jesus was presented in the temple, and this Simeon holds baby Jesus, calls him the comfort of Israel in his arms, and he blesses God and says, I have seen your salvation. So do you remember what Joel 1.16 said about the temple? Do you remember what it said? Hmm? Oh, verse 16 is not on there either? Oh, it is. Good. It says gladness and joy were cut off from the temple, right? There was no joy in the house of the Lord. So if you turn, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2, verses 27. So Luke 2, 27 to 32 talks about Simeon. Verse 27, Simeon, he was a righteous and devout man. He came by the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then Simeon took him in his arms and blessed God and said, now, Lord, you are letting your bondservant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the presence of all the peoples, a light for revelation for the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So is this gladness and joy returning to God's house and returning to the temple in the form of his son, light and glory and salvation in this little baby King Jesus? Gladness and joy returns in Christ. And then in Luke chapter 4, Jesus finds himself in the wilderness. And isn't it a comfort that he knows what a wilderness is like? He found himself in a dry and weary land, hungry, and faced with wilderness temptation, a colossal battle with the enemy. And here we found truths nestled in the story that will equip and encourage us in our own wilderness battles. Most of us struggle with a thought about, of being in a wilderness, It's not a place that we willingly go, um, but sometimes that's exactly where we find ourselves. And it's overwhelming and we might feel alone in the battle. 
Just as much as the wilderness was a trial for Jesus, it was also a proclamation to the enemy. Jesus was God's son, and he was not without help in the fight, and neither are we. Jesus battled back with the word of God, and he reminded the enemy that there's only one in control and that we are his. So we have trust in hard places, and knowing that truth means that we can go into battle filled up. Luke 4.1 says Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. So he was full of the Spirit. He was ready long before he was led into the wilderness. He continually sought God in prayer, and as we seek our Heavenly Father daily in good times and when it's hard, we find what we need, and our tank is full. Regardless of our circumstances, So when a trial hits, we might need to remind ourselves that we actually walk in overflowing rather than empty. And sometimes we can feel empty, right? But we are embattled on the outside, but strong within. The Spirit's in us. And so if you're in an unexpected trial, hold these truths close. You are His, and He's equipped you for battle. And when the storm clears, you might be bruised on the outside, um, but His strength's going to reign within Luke chapter 5 through 16, we see the ministry of Jesus. His power, his compassion, he encounters hopeless people who need a savior. His powerful ministry of healing the sick and raising the dead. Many miracles. We see warnings to Pharisee hearts who are puffed up with pride and dark on the inside, who place their value in their appearances and earthly things, and they miss the heavenly riches offered by God. We see parables, some confusing ones, a lot of confusing ones, and some beautiful ones, like the parable of the soils about a farmer scattering seeds. And you wonder if the people listening were confused, like why is this person known as a miracle worker giving us a lesson on agriculture and farming? But the disciples press in. They ask what it means, and they find out that the seed is God's word, and the soil is the heart of man. And whether or not the truth of God's word can produce, produce growth and godliness in a person's life will always depend on the condition of the heart that's listening. Jesus' parable holds such a beautiful reminder for all of us. If we want it to be obvious to the wor- world that we've spent time with Jesus, we need to do more than simply read his word. We need to choose to live it, meaning that we're humble enough to allow his word to interrupt us rearrange us and redirect our thinking throughout all our days, changed by him. And in Luke chapter 15, we see the gladness and joy of a father who welcomes home his prodigal son. We see a picture of a pursuing God who chases after his lost sheep, lost souls, until they're found. And then heaven rejoices and we see heaven's joy. So that brings us to chapter 17. So this is Luke part two. So open your binders, and we are actually going to work through a little bit of homework together. So if you open right to page one. Now I need my glasses. Also pull out your observation worksheet. So if you, unless you mark in your Bible, in the very back of your appendix, You'll actually have all the chapters printed out for you, for those of you that are new. So in the back, you'll find um, Luke chapter 17. I don't know what page it's on, sorry. Should maybe I do. Page 125. We're actually going to only look at the first 10 verses of Luke 17 tonight. So pull out Luke 17 and then pull out lesson one, page one. Pull out some markers. And then tell me when you're ready. So you will notice that our studies are now all ESV. Northview decided that we should be a little more uniform and across the board. It's easier for registration. It's easier for some of the page numbers were different. So you girlies that love your NASB, We can still mark in our Bibles. 
and it's still God's word. So that's enough of that. Um, okay, are we ready? Yes? Okay, page one. We're just going to do the lesson. Well, some of it, not all of it, because I don't want you to cheat. So lesson one. When the Son of Man comes, do you... Wait a minute, I can't see. Do you long to see one of the days of the Son of Man? Will the world be ready? And will he find faith on earth? This is boogie me. So day one. Your homework set out into five days. Um, so day one. Welcome to Luke part two. You have before you seven weeks of study that will not only answer many questions concerning the coming of the Son of Man, it will also, we believe, draw you into greater understanding of the depth of God's love and forgiveness and the hope of eternal life. And with this will come an assurance, a confidence, and a peace that will help you be unshakable in the storms that are on the horizon. Part one took us through Luke 16. So for those who weren't with us at that time, be assured, don't worry. It's all right to start in part two without having inductively studied the first part. You are going to be so ministered to by what you learn in the second part. Luke tells us in the opening verses why he wrote this gospel. So Luke 1, verse 1 to 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Eyewitnesses, right? People we can trust. Verse 3, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Do you think it's important that we know the truth of the gospel in our culture? And do you think it was important for them to know the truth at that time, to proclaim the truth? The subtitle for Luke part one is, Who is this man? And we learn to answer this question about Jesus. We also learn why he came. By way of review for those who studied part one, and to put new students into context, read the following verses. So Luke 9, verse 20. And he, Jesus, said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. So who is he? Who is Jesus according to this verse? Yeah, do you know? Yeah, the Christ, right? Christ means Messiah. So he's saying, I am the Messiah. I am the one. Luke 4, 43. But he, Jesus, said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. And Luke 5, 32. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So why did Jesus come according to those two verses? Why did he come? Preach the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And? Yeah, call sinners to repentance. So he tells us his purpose. Of course, there's much more in the first 16 chapters of Luke. So take a few minutes and read the chapter themes, which we kind of did in here. So let's begin our study of part two of Luke 17. Study well, seek him in prayer. He will be found in his wondrous precepts of life. So we are going to observe the first 10 verses of Luke 17. It says observe all of Luke 17, so we're only going to do the first 10. So you finish the rest at home. Um, number one on that, on that page there. There are many references as to when in this chapter. Mark them all. Many use a green circle. I use an orange circle. Don't know why. The days is a time reference. It's repeated quite a bit in this chapter, so pay attention to what day and whose day it's referring to. Number two, double underline in green, anything that tells you the where, so geographical locations. And then three, make a keyword bookmark. In the back of your study, there's a bookmark, right? So at the very back page, you can rip out or cut off, there's a bookmark at the back. <clears throat> there is some samples of how you can mark certain words that precepts given there. And then I always flip it over and write the words that I'm going to be marking in this particular study and mark it on there. So it's easy. You can refer to it easy if you forget, oh, how did I mark disciples or whatever. So there's a bookmark back there. 
Okay, so page three of your study, flip the page. They are suggesting what to mark. So there's A, B, C, D, E, F. So verses one to 10 don't have all of those words. So we're gonna mark three words as we read through this. So three colors or three different shapes, however you wanna do it. We are gonna mark disciples. So you can like blue underline it. We're gonna mark faith. And we're gonna mark forgive. I added one because I wanna mark forgive. So let's read through, look at Luke 17, and we'll read through those first 10 verses together and mark and observe. Ready? I feel shuffling. Almost ready? I'm ready. Okay. Luke 17, verse 1. He, Jesus, Jesus said to his disciples, mark disciples, It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through who they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. I mean, we start off with a bang, right? He were thrown into the sea, then that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Verse three, be on your guard. Your, who's your? Disciples, that's who he's talking to, right? So be on your guard. If your disciples... If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. So you can mark forgive. What? (laughs) Oh, because I downloaded it off the internet. (laughs) I'm caught in my own, like, be quiet and don't complain about your version thing. Just a minute. Just give me a minute. Well, do you want to mark in it? I can download it on here. Okay. You guys, that's funny. Thanks for interrupting me and not letting me go on for 20 minutes. Well, I just downloaded, like, you can download it from the... Yeah, and I just chose the nut because... Rewind. Rewind. Oh, it's very different. I just showed all my cards, right? (laughs) Okay, it is very different. We're going to start again. Verse 1. And he said, Jesus said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Verse three, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Mark forgive. And if he sins against you seven times in the day, so you can mark day, I guess, as a time reference if you want, and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Verse 5, the apostles, you can mark apostles like disciples. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. So mark faith there. And the Lord said, if you had faith, like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you, disciples, who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep, say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table. Will he not rather say to him, the servant, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you, disciples, you also, when you have done all that you were commanded. Say, we, disciples, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. So if you go back to your day two homework, on page three, 
So day one, you're actually gonna do the whole chapter 17, and then day two, you get a bit deeper. So question one says, now review Luke 17, verse one to 10. What's happening in these first 10 verses? Some of your answers may overlap. If they do, there's no need to rewrite what you've written. The questions are simply to help you understand the passage. So question A there. So who's being spoken about in this passage and what basic points are covered in these verses? List them below. If you see any connections, write them down. So let's walk through. So who is being spoken to in the passage? Disciples, yeah. So Jesus is talking to his disciples and what are the main points? Pardon? Yeah. Don't cause little ones to sin. What else? What else do you see? What about verse 1? Yeah, temptation will come, right? It's a sure thing. The Nasby says it's inevitable. <laughs> what else? What about verse 3? Forgive, yeah. And so he says, pay attention to yourselves in verse 3. In Nasby, it says, be on your guard. What do you think he's saying, be on guard of or pay attention to? Your own sin, falling into your own temptation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what else do you think? Yeah, unforgiveness, right? Guarding against unforgiveness. So I think it can reflect both guarding against temptations that are coming and guarding against the unforgiveness that you might have against a brother. What about faith? What do we see? Yeah, they ask him to increase their faith. And then what about the 7 to 10, the story about the servant? Oh, I want to go back for a minute. So verse 2, what does verse 2 tell you about the heart of God? cares for the little ones yeah and you kind of see his fierce father this fierce father executing justice on judgment on somebody that's going to be tempting one of his little ones to sin okay what about the servant plowing in the field what's up with that what's happening So we're just observing. So what's happening in these verses? Servants plowing the field. And then? He comes in. And then he has to serve his master before he can serve himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally. And so then we go to question B. What's the difference now between Luke 17, verses 7 to 10, so these last few verses about the servant, and then what's the difference in Luke 12? So turn to Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 38. I'll read it out loud too, but you can turn there. And we'll think it through a little bit. I 
I will be reading this from the NASB. So Luke 12, 35 to 38. So we're, we're looking for the difference. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch, so that's like midnight, or even the third, early in the morning, and finds them ready, blessed are those slaves. So what's the key difference between these two passages that you see? Yeah, the master serving the slave here. So it's the opposite. And then the next verses in chapter 12 talks about being ready for the Son of Man to come at an hour that you do not expect. So it's looking forward, right, to the return and for us to be ready. And then if you flip over to the next page, there's an application question there. Question two, so how are you measuring up as his disciple, his slave? Is there anything you need to work on and when will you start? And so it's good to take stock and reflect on our walk as a disciple. What? Oh, sorry. As a disciple of Jesus, it's good to ask the Spirit to press us in conviction and to ask if there's anything that we need to repent of, to turn from. David did that in Psalm 139. He prayed, search me and know my heart, O God, and try me. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there's any hurtful or wicked way in me and point out anything that offends you and lead me in the way everlasting. Romans 2.4 said says that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Conviction is a kindness. It brings us near to God. And as the Spirit presses and convicts our hearts, it's also good to remember his grace in it. True conviction from the Holy Spirit will never result in condemnation. Romans 8.1 tells us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the law of the Spirit has set you free from sin and death and what the law could not do because human nature was too weak. God did by sending his own son as an offering for sin. So when we come to him in confession, the blood of Jesus perfectly and thoroughly covers every act of rebellion, every hint of sin that never even left your thought life. And he washes you clean and he exchanges it for a record without blemish. The moment we see him, we're going to be made like him. Our repentance and surrender and his grace and freedom in Christ. So yes, we plead with God to give us the heart of a true disciple, to lead us to repentance. Ask him to help you be alert and ready and on guard. And it's in his strength that we fully follow in our weakness. Christ in you the hope of glory. Colossians 1, Paul says this, for this purpose, the purpose of proclaiming the gospel, the purpose of discipleship, for this purpose, I toil and I strive, I labor, but he said it's according to his power, his strength, which mightily works within me. And I think especially as women, we can get this wrong. I think we can burden ourselves. We can spiritually compare ourselves to each other, creating spiritual to-do lists, and the weight of needing to do better, do more, be better. But it's all him. And if you let that sink in, that it's him, it's not me, it just lifts a weight off your chest because it's surrender, and surrender brings freedom. And so when you feel like you just can't anymore, he can. So whatever wilderness you're currently walking through, I'm sure there's all different things in this room, broken hearts, from wounded relationships, heavy mama hearts for kids making wrong choices, or just plain weariness in your soul that makes you feel overwhelmed, maybe sickness. Just remember that you're not alone in the battle. You are not without help, just like Jesus in the wilderness. You are equipped with God's spirit. And Jesus battled back with the word of God. He reminded the enemy that there's only one in control. And we are his, and so we have trust in our hard places. 
and trust and surrender in Jesus brings peace. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to sing. Lord God, thank you for your word, whether it's NASB or ESV, it's your word, Lord, and I thank you for these women and their excitement and joy to dig in and to know you more. And so I pray for hearts that are burdened and heavy tonight. I pray for hearts that are full of joy. Um, God, that you would meet us where we are, that we would know Jesus more after studying. Um, yeah, and that you'd give us an excitement to dive in into this season and to come and discuss with other women who are hungry to know you more. So I pray that we will praise and honor you in whatever season we're in. In Jesus' name, amen.